Well, shit, I guess this one's dedicated to you, guy. Lost in Vivo is a first-person survival horror game released fairly recently and created by the indie game developer Akuma Kira, known most for Spooky's House of Jump Scares. Or Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion now, I guess, I don't really know. Lost in Vivo is actually a Kickstarter game from Kira and was made on a rather small budget of $5,305. If nothing else, I have to respect Lost in Vivo for being made primarily by one guy for that amount. Lost in Vivo, despite its perspective, is heavily influenced by the Silent Hill series, a comparison which most people covering the game seem to be using, and for good reason. It wears the inspiration on its sleeve, and the similar style is what drew me to the project in the first place, so let's dive in and see how it fares on its own merits. You play as a nameless, faceless protagonist out walking their service dog one day. The weather begins to take a turn for the worst, and your canine companion is washed down a storm drain. Giving chase, you go down to the sewers after it. Beyond having a setup straight out of Master Blaster, I found the introduction to Lost in Vivo to be a bit excessive. What could have easily been established in a 10 or 15 second cutscene takes about 2 minutes of just holding down the W key to wait for things to actually happen. The game doesn't have lengthy lulls of absolutely nothing after this point, but it was a lousy first impression. The general gameplay is better than this introduction would imply, as Lost in Vivo is a first person horror game with some actual combat in it. Is it great engrossing combat? Well, no, it's pretty formulaic and lacking any real standout high points, but the inclusion made me more interested than I would have been otherwise. The player is given two options for combat, melee and gunplay, with two options being provided for each. The melee is basic, you swing your weapon by pressing and holding mouse 1, and you can toggle a block by clicking mouse 2. As far as first-person melee combat systems go, it ain't no condemned, but it's functional. The gunplay is also a touch awkward, but in a more interesting way, as the two guns given have their own ups and downs. The starting handgun, in a bit of an odd choice, is actually the stronger of the two, but will randomly jam as you fire it. The shotgun has 100% consistency rate, but is weaker by virtue of the rock salt shells that act as ammo for it. This is a clever dichotomy. General issues hamper the combat, as it's still difficult to discern depths while swinging objects in first person, and the gun's aim down the sight feature and sway is a touch excessive, but it works well enough for what it's trying to pull off. Each area the player visits provides new enemies to fight, and while they're not unique in their attack patterns for the most part, they provide enough visual variety to keep things interesting. The level design is all around decent, with most areas requiring backtracking, some loops here and there, and objectives that could be cleared out of order. Nothing is a real standout of map design, but it works well enough. Puzzles are mostly basic affairs, being flip these switches or get these things, but they're not insultingly simple, and there is one particular puzzle involving an apple that was actually pretty damn clever. And one thing that I genuinely didn't expect was that Lost in Vivo would have some decent New Game Plus support. From the hour or so I spent playing around with it, I saw remixed enemy locations and new enemy types being introduced, and I'm confident there's more here that I missed. Overall, the additional support that repeat playthroughs are given is a great addition. It isn't all rosy on the support front, as Lost in Vivo is a fairly buggy game at the moment. Throughout my run, I encountered models freaking out, I fell through the world, textures disappeared, and encountered some truly bizarre hitboxes for interactable objects. One bad hangup I had, which unfortunately I didn't record, was when I stepped onto a subway to transition into a new area. While in the cart, the transition didn't occur and I was stuck on the frozen subway cart unable to interact with anything at all. I'm not sure how easy it is to replicate the issue, since in the two subsequent runs I did I didn't encounter the issue, but it was something that put a damper on my enjoyment of the game, at least the first time around. Lost in Vivo has a minimalistic look that it rocks fairly well, and for a game made mostly by one guy, it's pretty impressive stuff. The monster designs are well done for the most part, as while some can range from goofy to forgettable, the ones that work really work. They probably have some sort of thematic significance too, I think the mirror enemy is pretty clear in context, but I haven't put too much thought into it. The music is pretty decent as well, as it's applicable for the game and accompanies, but I personally found it to be too derivative of Akira Yamaoka's work for the Silent Hill games. There's homage, and then there's this. I think Jasper Burns' soundtrack for Lone Survivor was a much better way to have some similarities to his sound while still making something unique in its own right. The sound design on the other hand is some genuinely good stuff. The game uses 3D audio which it shows off in a pretty clever way in a sequence when you have to whistle for your dog, and the game is much better off for it. The noises within the environment and from the creatures are all pretty unnerving stuff, 
and the use of silence properly accentuates the louder portions well. Listen to the game's advice and use a decent pair of headphones while playing this. Though the only downside will be dealing with the bizarre mixing that can render certain things way too loud. The train is probably the worst offender for that. The best way to describe the story of Lost in Vivo is minimalistic, as it doesn't take center stage of the game and what attention to detail is placed in it is subdued and not rammed down the player's throat. Hell, good chunks of the intended narrative have flown clear over my head, be frank. The narrative is secondary to the scares, however, and the backseat approach to the storytelling is made weaker by the game's Kickstarter page basically describing the plot's outline to you. The story here has some vague similarities to Silent Hill, but overall the game reminded me more of Cry of Fear than anything else, with maybe a touch of Remikulski's downfall in here as well. Judging it on its own, I really wasn't crazy about the story in Lost in Vivo. It's a psychological horror story that has no central character to tie the audience to, which is something that all of the titles which I compare it to had. While you can have interpretations of who the main character in the game is, I have my own, at the end of the day you're just playing as a mute blank slate with no defined characteristics of their own. It's asking me to care about the companion and personal well-being of a brick, basically. Imagine if in Half-Life the game suddenly expects you to care about Gordon Freeman, that's how jarring the lead of Lost in Vivo is for me. The game also makes a very large allusion to the Divine Comedy, specifically the famous Inferno portion by including scenes from the silent film adaption at one point. Hell, early sections of the game bear a vague resemblance to aspects of the poem, but I'd have to carefully compare the two before actually coming to a conclusion on that. I'm really not sure what this could mean, but it seems important, and it's a somewhat out of the way easter egg so it seemed worth mentioning. Evaluating how the scares work is kind of tricky because of how subjective an emotional reaction like fear actually is. So just keep in mind that this is how I react to the scares, and if you had an alternative reaction that I didn't, that's perfectly valid. Anyway, from where I stand, when Lost in Vivo works as a horror game, it really works. On the flip side, it falls flat on its face in other areas. As mentioned prior, the audio design is excellent and really enhances the atmosphere. There are clever visual tricks like hallways appearing out of nowhere when your back is turned which are also very effective. And there are plenty of little moments here where the game is downright tense, a highlight being a segment where the player has to pick a lock. It's all simple tricks, but they're done with a complete mastery over them that it was hard not to get wrapped up in Lost in Vivo at first. Keywords there, at first. Lost in Vivo uses one of my least favorite tropes in modern horror games, which is the fourth wall break. Multiple scares in Lost in Vivo play on this concept, essentially reminding the player that they're just playing a video game and using that to try and spook them. Again, this is just a personal thing, but fourth wall scares completely take me out of whatever atmosphere or experience that a horror game is trying to construct, and without spoiling anything, maybe one of them is actually unique in its own right. If you've played Eternal Darkness or I'm Scared of Pixelated Nightmare, then you've seen all the tricks that Lost in Vivo has up its sleeve. It's even worse for Lost in Vivo than in most examples, and I feel the same way about it here as I do in the bandwagon fad that was Doki Doki Literature Club. The game is trying to have its cake and eat it too by both trying to construct a psychological horror game with a plot open to interpretation, while constantly reminding the audience, who are already trying to suspend their disbelief and become invested in said plot, that it's just a program running on their computer. Again, it's probably only me who's bothered by stuff like this, but once it started happening, it immediately turned me off from the story. At the end of it all, I'm torn on Lost in Vivo. It's incredibly solid stuff when it works, but when it doesn't, the quality becomes spotty. The combat is rudimentary, but at least it provides some form of engagement with the enemies. The levels are all serviceable, but nothing outstanding or unique. The game looks nice, all things considered, but it's brought down by the prior mentioned bugs and the occasional performance issues. It has a story that's subdued and open to interpretation, but it is at the same time spelled out on the Kickstarter page for the audience and lacks any real driving focus. The scares are a mixed bag, and the game often uses fourth wall breaks which I personally dislike. Lost in Vivo is a serviceable horror game with some moments of sheer brilliance interlaced within, but on the whole is brought down by its listed issues and honestly just not feeling very inspired. I think the reason that everyone compares it to Silent Hill is simply because of how much of that game's style it borrows from, and in the process Lost in Vivo never actually forms an identity of its own. There's some Silent Hill in here, a little cry of fear, some I'm scared, and a possible dash of downfall, but there isn't anything here that I could point back to being uniquely Lost in Vivo. 
I don't regret the time that I spent with it, and I wholeheartedly respect Akuma Kira for his work on the game, but I can only recommend this game to horror junkies really craving another fix.